Topping Talks. Hundred and five hours a week can't be beat. Welcome to Topping Talks. Topping Talks is a Topping Tribune production, and today's episode is proudly sponsored by Topping Technologies and Express VPN. Topping Technologies is an IT value added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in security. Heck, I see their founder at least twice a day. I have to say he's quite handsome and brilliant. If you're a business in Texas that can use a hand, you can reach us at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Also, are you part of the 3.6% of Americans who still care about your privacy? If you are, then perfect. ExpressVPN can exist. Even though 96% of stats are made up on the spot, ExpressVPN does guarantee 100% via their 30-day Mac money guarantee. Now, without further ado, I'm proud to say that I'm interviewing my friend and client at IT Security Director, Mitch Lehman. Afternoon. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks for coming on the show, bud. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So... Uh, it's kind of cliche, but how did you first get I- into IT back in the day? Well, you know, I guess I was, uh, it, you know, uh, our high school actually had an IT shop that we never knew about until much, much later. I was actually a couple of us from high school that uh, got into computers much later in life. And, uh, yeah, we were working. I did some work for uh, the Green Sheet. i um, not sure if anyone's familiar with that. Now, what's what's that? They were uh, an ad paper in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And um, I went to work. I actually started in sales there and then ended up in the IT department doing uh, pagination and building out, you know, the, 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 the newspaper as, so, as it was the ad paper, I guess it was. And then went to work for a company called the recycler who was out of Southern California. They started, they were a free ad paper. They were a little bit different. You know, the, the green sheet is free, but you pay for the ads and they were just the opposite. The ads were free, but you bought the paper. So, so how do you transition to sales and IT? That's, <laughs> that's a big different subject. <laughs> well, I did, I'd done, I'd done, you know, uh, mechanical engineering for years and then IT was just very interesting and it just, really clicked with me and, you know, got into it. And then, you know, and even at the time I started, you know, getting into modems and dial up and, you know, a lot of times even back then we didn't have, you know, we were just on BBS boards more than the internet, you know, some BBS boards had internet access and you could maybe even get an email through them or whatever, but mm-hmm. the vast majority of them were just BBSs and didn't really even have the, <laughs> the ability to do uh, real internet back then. Right. Oh, really? Oh my yeah. Gosh. And then when you did get internet and if pictures or videos came across, you know, they loaded so slow. <laughs> it took <laughs> a long time to get anything downloaded back then. So, And, um, yeah, that was a great gig because it taught me a lot about bandwidth and networking but because we had to build these newspapers and, you know, and the recycler was very much about doing everything inside Windows and because um, we were actually a Windows, um, it was in Windows Advanced Server. It wasn't, it wasn't even Windows NT back then. We were originally on Windows Advanced Server. We built a, a database and a, um, a pagination system around that to, to deploy uh, throughout the United States. <laughs> and it was a, a really fun job because you learned so much about the Microsoft Foundation when they got started. You know, and they were building all of the access and the front ends pieces. It was just it was just a lot of fun to me. I just thought it was really great and just continued down the road and then ended up in Amory, uh, which was, um, you know, Sears Home Improvement. Oh, no way. So is that a subsidiary or what? what well, that? Amory was the company. It was an American remodeling company, and they actually were the Sears Home Improvement brand for a long time. And um, and I believe uh, Mr. Weaver was the, the was the original founder. And then when he left, we, we were still around, and we'd been there for a few years. And then eventually they tried to move to Century 21 Home Improvement. That didn't work out as well. <laughs> and uh, they ended up filing bankruptcy. Um, I left, uh, and I went to, and that's when I went to Sabre. It was right after that, so. I left there after they filed bankruptcy. We got our check handed to us the last day we were there. And they're like, <laughs> there you uh, go. And, uh, and and ultimately, I ended up doing a lot of side gig with that job because there was a couple of other companies that um, that were part of it. The uh, Facelifter Group, mm-hmm. they acquired their their pieces back, and I helped them move their data center. And then Home Depot actually bought a big chunk of the Amory Group, oh, and really? I helped build their call their um, their call center and their um, and their database system out in Florida. So. Oh wow, that's awesome! Uh, yeah, that was a pretty fun job too. And what's what's Saber for the folks who aren't from Texas and or in the aviation industry? <laughs> yeah, so a lot of you that don't know, it was American Airlines. And actually, when I went there, it was American Airlines IT department is what they were called. It was Amaris IT is what they called us back then for AMR. And uh, then they, you know, they switched us over to Saber. And basically, we handled my group handled all of the airlines outside of America. Mm. So our group was, you know, we did Canadian. Southwest Airlines, we did the Delta for, you know, Delta did their baggage through, um, their baggage system was through Sabre as well. And, oh, cool. um, 
And I think that was the old Braniff system that they use for Southwest Airlines because um, we had acquired that when we were Sabre. And then, you know, I did a lot of work for First Air. I did a lot of work for Middle East Airlines. Oh, South, wow. South African Airlines, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, Siberian Air. I, I got to travel all over. I got to go to Siberia. <laughs> I got to go to, you know, the North Pole for First Air in Canada. And Oh, wow, really? Yeah, I was in Pangerton, Kaluik, Kujawak, um, all those little Arctic towns and yeah. stuff, you know, setting up their, uh, you know, their, their systems. Uh, we actually, we actually tunneled IP over X25 back then. That's Cause we didn't have real, uh, internet or, you know, frame relay or anything like that. Even back then, we just had X25 in those areas. Oh my gosh. And so we tunneled IP over X25 to, to set up their, their mail as well as, you know, their, their reservation system and so forth. Oh my gosh. And what's your favorite story from Sabre when you're traveling out and kind of doing some of those gigs? Well, when I was stuck one time, I was stuck up there in a, a Kalawit for a while and a Kalawit's a pretty large town. It's, it's South of the Arctic circle, but it's a fairly large town and it has a hospital. And uh, one of the pilots for first air was there and he was one of the bush pilots. You know, he basically broke, it was like a de Havilland plane. It wasn't a pressurized cab. You know, we can only fly at about 10,000 feet. And he was like, Hey, I'll do hospital runs this weekend. If you're bored, you know, I'll tell you when I'm going, if you want to come just show up and I'll, and you can fly with me. So we did, we did some hospital runs and, and the first thing he told me was, Hey, when we go on the plane, here's where the, um, the flare gun is and this and this. And he's like, and if we crash, shoot me first and then shoot yourself. I'm like, why am I going to shoot myself? He said, because if you don't, the polar bears will get to us first. Oh, geez. And I'm like, tell you what I'll do. I'll wait until I see a polar bear and I'll shoot you. But then I'll figure out what I'm going to do later. But, and he's like, I don't care as long as you shoot me. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll do that for you. So. I, I, I blame Coca-Cola for humanizing the, those cute yeah. bears. So everyone thinks they're all cute and cuddly because the commercials, when in reality, yeah. They're very vicious. <laughs> well, and that's what I, and, you know, some of the guys I'd met up there, you know, that I, I met a guy up there one time and he, that's all he did was sit in like a, a bear blind and watch for bears coming into yeah. town. Right. I'm like, well, what do y'all do? Do y'all relocate him? He goes, Nope. He said, once they come in, they, he said, we kill them because he said, once they get that brave, he says, they're going to hurt somebody. He said, yeah. they're going to get in and attack somebody. So, so I'm like, wow, that's, that's kind of crazy. You know? So absolutely. Once have it, to deal with that. Right. <laughs> oh, definitely. That's, <laughs> It's like something we don't think about in DFW. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the caribou just walk around downtown down there. It's just like they're everywhere. Right? Really? Oh, yeah. They're just walking around. And <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's a pretty neat area. You know, um, you know it's definitely cold. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the most yeah. exciting thing we got in DFW, I know when I worked at, when I was in inside sales at HPE, it was at the old EDS headquarters on 5400 Legacy Drive. Mm -hmm. And to that day, they still had that family of bobcats who just buy that legendary building. They had their little, you know, mama, papa, and they had all the cute... <laughs> Bobcats running around, and I think that's the most exciting thing I've seen locally. <laughs> and that, yeah. that was kind of your second furry into IT, right? Yeah, yeah, that was, and, uh, you know, Sabre, you know, really, you know, got me out there and, uh, you know, globally, you know, where I got to travel. I got to do Mauritius. I don't know if you're familiar with Mauritius. It's a, it's a, it's an island country that's kind of in between, like, between, you know, like Madagascar and India, if you kind of drew two lines yeah. horizontal and vertical you'd kind of run into mauritius it's out there in the ocean and oh really yeah it's a it was a beautiful beautiful you know hawaii type you know islands and whatever so uh yeah we i, I was very lucky i got to do a lot of great gigs like that that there wasn't a ton of work and yeah you know, just kind of hung out you know in a tropical paradise for you know a couple of weeks and you know do a few hours worth of work was that was always fun at Saber, you know, if you yeah. had but we did have some bigger projects that yeah. you know sometimes ate a lot of time. <laughs> Reno Airlines comes to mind. Our friends at Reno Airlines, if anybody ever remembers them out there. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most challenging project you had over there? Was it could have been Reno. That was a real challenging project because ultimately they were going out of business and they were looking what they were trying to do was defer their costs, their IT costs. Yeah. Into Saber and then ultimately they didn't have the budget to do anything with it. So uh -oh. it made it, it made it very difficult to, to help them yeah. get things done because like I said, they did not have the yeah, budget to just do going it out. Yeah. Yeah. They had computers that were in so old and such bad shape. We would go load, like, you know, we would reload our software mm -hmm. and then when they would reboot the, the, the PC, it would just corrupt the hard drive and we'd have to, re, you know, we'd have to fix the hard drive and go through, you know, and, 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 and I remember one of the guys at uh, pro systems, he was, 
at Pro Systems. He was there, the manager for Pro Systems. And I guess they owned the PCs and we owned kind of the, you know, the reservation system and stuff. Mm-hmm. And as we're talking to him and we're troubleshooting, we're like, hey, you know, what we got to do is we got to replace these boxes because ultimately they, you know, they get, the hard drives get corrupt and, you know, we can't, you know, we have to reinstall the applications every day. And that's not something we can continue to do. Yeah. Well, he was like, oh, it's, it's just the data that's getting corrupted, not the application. How does the hard drive know what is data and what's application to corrupt? Yeah. He's like, well, that's just what it does. I'm like, well, it's not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was always interesting. You know, our friends at Pro Systems didn't want to spend any money and, you know, everybody across the board. So it made it a real difficult time. But I think we did a good job. You know, we um, we did the, we did actually did the migration for Reno Airlines. We actually cut everything over. And at Sabre, I don't know if you're, if, if, if anybody's familiar with, you know, a migration like that we used to do is we used to take the tapes and we'd get a digital copy of them and we would upload them. Then they would fly the tapes to our data center in Tulsa and our data center in Tulsa would take the tapes and then they would do a checksum on the data that we received and then the tapes. Mm -hmm. As we were doing the tapes, we found they didn't match. So we had to fall back. Now the funny thing about that was is we actually had to touch all of the printers and change out the EEPROMs in all the ticket printers because they were on the EDS system. We were on the Saber system, oh, so they were different, <laughs> and the formatting was different. So you had to, ch- so we had to go back and put those EEPROMs back for the EDSs, make sure they were on the EDS network, get them all. Re- so we basically had to just we deployed everything and then had to fall right back. Oh jeez! And then what we found was EDS had just mislabeled the tapes. No. So like the tapes were one, two, three, and four, and they were yeah. four, three, two, one. So when, so when we were uploading them, the checksums were wrong, but it was because the the, the, the data was correct. It was just the labels were wrong on oh, each shit. tape. So. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That <laughs> that cost EDS a lot of money um, after a, the fact because they had to pay for the, just, the second one. So. Just the wrong labels. Mm-hmm. That the one, wrong labels. That's got to be, I feel, got to feel bad for that one guy. Just oh, yeah. one mislabel yeah. and it just crashed the whole thing. It just wouldn't work. But it made us feel so much better because the next week when we ran through it, it was so much smoother. Yeah, you know, We got through it quicker. You know, we'd already done it once. And, you know, that's the way I always looked at it. It was a positive oh, we got out of it because it, we, it was like a practice run. Oh, yeah. So. That's always half, half full, too, if you squint hard enough in life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I can't imagine the fiscal cost of that. Like, so much. To well, and they had, an M, they had a, uh, one of the MD-80s. Uh, Reno had one of the MD-80s at Reno, and they were flying me, just me, <laughs> and oh, a wow. crew to, I think I was, I think I did San Francisco, San Jose, Orange County, LAX, and Ontario. With the, with the airports I did, with with that plane, just me. Yeah. And I flew and I did all their just, e-proms. And just, is it just you in the plane? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the crew was there. I mean, we had a flight attendant and the the pilots, right? So, oh, my gosh, it was like a private jet. It was like my own private awesome, jet. It's yeah. an MD-80, and you're like, <laughs> weird, man. Well, that's, that's unheard of because, I mean, nowadays, every single, every, every single flight is always overbooked because oh, yeah. they have to count for attrition. So, like, the, the days of where you wish, like, Oh, I hope there's no one next to me, so I have some elbow room. Those days are gone. Like, oh yeah, yeah, there's not enough. Well, that was great back then because we got the flight benefits, right? And the flight benefits, you could fly pretty much anywhere. And and you know, the load factor back then was around seventy percent. So you yeah. know, there was always you know ten, twenty percent seats usually on a flight. Oh wow! So you could get to places and go places, right? It's not true anymore. The flight benefits just aren't what they used to be. Well, no, I, I was probably just mm-hmm. also cost too. I mean, yeah, keeping yeah. an airline in business is not. It's not easy. I mean, yeah. Well, and they're, and they're much more efficient. You know, the database systems we had, the fuel, yeah. mo- you know, I, I, you know, even today with transportation, like we had a Tuesday morning. I mean, you know how those costs are built in now that we didn't, we didn't have those tools back then. I mean, we had some rudimentary tools and we could do some big picture things, but it was, it was much limited what we could do per, you know, flights and so forth. I mean, it, it was, it was a more limited capability that we yeah. had today. But today it's so automated. It's just like, we well, you know exactly how to make oh, this yeah. more efficient. You know? <laughs> knows before you need to know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is always fun. Oh, yeah. And then what inspired you to go over EDS? Well, and when I was at Sabre, um, I had a friend of mine that had gone to EDS. And he was like, man, we're working over here on this mobile project. You're going to love it. It's a, You should come over and do it. They need somebody to help on their network. And I was like, oh, well, you know, okay. So we talked, and um, they offered a lot of money. So I went, and I went to work over there. Um, at EDS, and I worked. I worked at uh, Exxon, but well, it was mobile before. Right? It was, was yeah. right before the mobile Exxon 
you know, merger in yeah. 2000. So, and we were working on the Y2K project. So we, you know, they really? were upgrading all their, all their hardware, all their, you know, it, they had old AGX pluses they had such old, they had such old catalyst gear that it like was like the original catalyst gear. I mean, we oh had gosh. so much stuff we were just replacing and <laughs> retiring. And, and most of my stuff I did was just the configurations, the engineering docs, you know, and then ordering like here, you know, yep. and then get it to the teams and get them, you know, and then basically reporting on it. And, um, what we found was in Nigeria, we had, um, they, you know, they are part of the, uh, encryption export, uh, restricted countries, uh, in Nigeria really? and Exxon has, our mobile has a huge presence there. Yeah. So they had a huge presence there. I mean, they pretty much outsourced all of their oil to them back then. I don't know what they do now, but back mm -hmm. then we pretty much we had mobile. We, we, we pumped the oil out of the ground. We put it in the ships. We shipped most of it. Yeah. It was all just kind of us. And then, you know, they, more times than not, they would take loads and say, yeah. you owe us money, so we're going to keep this and oh, we'll give you this money, you know, out of this. Right? <laughs> but that was a, a, an interesting piece because in Nigeria, since it was an encryption control country, we couldn't just send a large, you know, 6,500 chassis or 6,000. It was the 6,000. We didn't even have the 6,500 yet. Uh, but, you know, it was like the 6,009 or whatever you wanted to send. Well, you couldn't do that because the processing power was too great. Really? So it was restricted. So we had to buy, you know, the, the, I forget which model it was back then, but it was basically like the 2960 or, you know, the, their, their 48 port, their little 48 port switches. We had to buy, I want to say it was like 1100 of those. 1100 <laughs> switches? Yeah. Oh my for God. all of Nigeria, for that whole setup out there. Um, oh my God. And <laughs> that, that replaced all the gear that we had out there. So. Wait, so, it, so the gear just couldn't be too advanced? Yeah, it just couldn't be too advanced. Like it just couldn't. Oh, yeah you know, have certain processing capabilities. So, so that was always fun. You know, you know, that was a big one, but you know, and then the rest of the, the stuff we did, we, we did a lot of, we changed out a lot of old, you know, network gear, their packet radio and stuff. Cause they had a lot of packet radio that needed to be replaced. And oh, really? yeah, a lot of used stuff that, you know, I, I've, I'd worked with in the past. So mm -hmm. I had a lot of experience with it. So it was pretty easy for me to figure all that out. But that was fun too. That was pretty cool. <laughs> did you get to go to Nigeria, or do you get to travel out of EDS? I didn't really. When I was working out of EDS, I mostly was all here in Dallas. You know, yeah. for everything. Uh, there was, I think, we did do some travel to um, to Seattle, but that was not really related to that project. It was a couple of others. So, and were you at the fifty four hundred location, or were you at the original, no, was, original headquarters or the second yeah, headquarters? I was. I was mainly at, at Mobile downtown. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. at the at the old uh, Renaissance Tower building. Yeah, uh, but I did. We did have. Uh, facilities up in uh, the old plant up there. Right? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. And then my old boss, you know, when he left, he went to Fiserv. So he's now, I think he's at Fiserv and he's, he ran, he runs their uh, data center, one of their data centers in Wisconsin now. So, oh, cool. And he was our project lead on that project at EDS. So, and then when, when Fiserv, that piece, because that Fiserv piece was a portion of EDS, they went on and he, he went with them and oh, stayed. Okay. So. And then I ended up at Nortel, which that was always so much fun because I got to learn VoIP. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, Nortel was not big into doing VoIP. They just wanted to, you know, use their old gear and put an IP card on it and say, it's now VoIP enabled. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it was a it was a very interesting job. Nortel was a was a weird place to work because, you know, it was when I got there, they were still booming mm -hmm. and they were still of that weird mindset that Spend money, spend money, spend money. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, I got yelled at. I, I had a, a friend of mine that was working at Verizon at the time, and he was one of the sales reps over there. And um, we were at one of the conferences, our conferences in Vegas. And uh, it was my job to take him out to dinner. So we took him to one of the, one of the Emerald Lagasse Steakhouses there in Vegas. Oh, nice. And I think there was four of us. It was like $700 or something, you know, at the end of the night. I paid the bill, <clears throat> you know, with my company card and signed off. And I turned in my receipt. The next week I got yelled at because I didn't spend enough money What that customer. I'm like, <laughs> what, what year is this? <laughs> that was around 2000. So, 2000? you know, 2001, right? You know, in that, in that, in that era, right? And um, they were still, but they were, they were in that, you could see them going down, right? Their prices yeah. were going down. People were, that was the funny thing is you, a lot of guys at Nortel would be like, oh, I'm going to buy the stock now. It's down to $20. And you're like, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> Yeah, when I left Nortel, I think I had invested around like thirty grand in my four hundred one k, and it was worth a little over two hundred dollars when I left. Oh shit! So 
yeah. devastating. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it, it, it ate up all the principal because you know we invest. You know we were all. You know I was kind of stupid at the time too. I was like, well, let's invest it in Nortel. It'll come back. And yeah. Yeah. It did. It oh did. man. <laughs> so is it just a fun place to work? Is kind of more energetic and entrepreneurial spirited, or was it another fun thing you liked about working there? Well, it, it was it was interesting because I think you know there were so many products. There was the fiber products. There was the wireless products. There was the VoIP products. There was the voice products. Uh, the traditional network products, you know, the yep. Bay Network stuff that they had, um, and all that was great. And um, and I wrote a lot of the training and all that for that, and that was kind of fun. You know, we had the 3900 sets. You know, we had the ITG card for the, the Meridians and the SL100 platform. So we wrote a lot of that stuff out. And that was always – and I, I thought that was great and fun and, you know, neat. But ultimately, you know, Nortel was pre pretty dysfunctional. I mean, they um, – yeah, we would do – we would do meetings – you know, once a quarter to lay everybody off because you oh, you laid off your bottom 10%. Oh, geez. Oh, you laid off the bottom 10% every quarter. That's so, like GE. Yeah, that's what they did. Oh, gosh. And, um, you know, because they, you know, and when they started it, we we went into a room, we were, all the managers were talking, and I was like, hey, you guys are telling us that, you know, 70%, you know, at that 70% mark, get let, you know, that once you get below that 20%, these are your contributors. These are the people that make your business. Yeah. So doesn't that mean in three quarters we're going to start eating into that? And they're like, no, we won't. And I'm like, well, found that. Doesn't that mean that what you're doing doesn't work? Yeah. <laughs> like, well, no, it works. I'm like, how does it work if <laughs> you don't eat into the productive? <laughs> so, so I guess their thought was that no matter what you did, there was always a bottom ten percent. So if that yeah. person was productive today, mm -hmm. they're going to eventually become unproductive. I, I guess is what their thought was, but so. I don't know. Well, it sounds like they were letting, letting good people go. Or They were. They definitely were. And that's when I decided to go find. And they really weren't doing VoIP. Like I said, they were just putting IP cards in a lot of their chassis. Yeah. And so that's when I got to work at, at, at GenBand, which was Vocal Data back then, uh, yeah. as a startup. And, you know, I went to work there, and I left. And then, was it 2007, we acquired Nortel back. You know? oh, really? So, <laughs> yeah. So that was like, hey, come on back into the fold. So a lot of the succession guys were there. And, you know, we took that system and, you know, built a cloud system with it. And, and you know, Don, Don and I yeah. worked on a lot of that. So, so, so GenBand actually created this um, hosted service that, you know, we, we always used it. Like, we, like when I got there, that was the main thing I did was we used our own phone system. It was our own PBX. Um, you know, I ran, I ran. So when I, at, when I was at Vocal Data, right before we went to GenBand, I was over IT, system test, and interop. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we, we would uh, take our, our basically our PBX, which was the hosted system that we had for Vocal Data, mm -hmm. and we ran a lot of emulators on it 24 hours a day. I ran, I was running, I think we, we had emulators running around 10,000 calls an hour, every hour. Just all the time on the system. Just wow. so we would catch bugs, right? Yeah. So if we caught memory leaks or things of that nature, right? So as we would so as as we would get a new release, we would take, you know, what would be our release candidate, mm -hmm. we would deploy it to corporate. That would be like the first step. If so it was a live system. Yeah. It was the first live system was our corporate system. And then we would write the documentation to say, hey, this is how we do the upgrades. We get it to the to the upgrade team, you know, writing those guys that was great. Our support team there was amazing. And then they would go out and start deploying it. And then if we found issues in deployment, we'd take it back and get them fixed or, you know, do patches. Or in some cases, you know, we done a lot of stuff where we worked with the Cisco gateways to you know, work for echo cancellation. We did a lot of that. Cisco actually sent three engineers down here to us for about a month. And oh, really? Because the 5400 gateways and those 5800 gateways, they had um, their echo cancellation was not very good. For the, um, for the calls. For the calls. Yeah. So as you'd go ISDN channels off of that, if you wanted to put, you know, one of their gateways somewhere, you had a lot of echo. So, uh, and the Cisco phones actually were even worse because they actually came in really hot. They came in higher than most phones because if you used a Polycom phone, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be as noticeable as it was a Cisco phone and a Cisco gateway. Really? So, yeah. So we, <laughs> and, and we didn't really have very many parameters to tweak the echo cancellation. So when they came down, they brought us new coded and we learned a lot about their DSPs and how they cut off, how they turn on, you know, where to do that, that gain and decrease. And like I said, they were there about a month and we fixed a lot of those issues and, you know, worked through a lot of them. And, and then, um, they deployed them all throughout Canada, um, you know, for, uh, Primus 
and Primus was one of our big customers up there. And uh, so they, you know, Primus used a lot of those Cisco gateways and then our phones as well um, and our system. So that was always a fun, that was, that was a lot of fun because we got to learn, you know, not just how we do stuff because mm-hmm. it was an integrated platform. We, we had voicemail with exchange tied to that. We had our phone system. We had, we even manufactured phones and ATAs and all that. Oh, really? The time. Yeah. Cause when they started, no, nobody else was making them. So yeah. IP phone specifically. Yeah, IP yep. phone specifically. And then Cisco got in there pretty well. And then I think uh, eventually we got to where we were actually lighting up more phones than Cisco was for a while. Cause oh, they wow. actually, they published the, the skinny protocol, the SCCP protocol. They actually published it. Mm-hmm. And then they pulled back and they said, wait a minute, we're going to pull that back now. <laughs> Y'all stop. And everybody's like, no, we're not stopping. Cause there was a few, there was quite a few people out there that did it. So, um, and then they ended up acquiring Sapura and Linksys and the others, um, that came up. And, um, you know, just add them to their pro- their product portfolio. And then when we acquired <coughs> Genband, we built that o- our own hosted PBX, and we put it in AWS, <coughs> you know, because they had migrated. The developers had built a lot of that. We had a oh, lot really? of our own. We had a lot of our own hardware we still used, mm-hmm. you know, like our S3 gateway and our S2, but they had moved a lot of stuff into the cloud. So they had moved our SBCs and a few others into the AWS. So, <coughs> so we migrated all of that system into um, AWS. Was that... Was that kind of when AWS was just getting off the ground? Yeah, that was probably about 2009, right? Yeah. So to, to 2009 or so is when we did that. And then, you know, we continued to improve and get better. And, you know, they offered that as a product. That was that was a great that was a great time. I, I enjoyed that a lot because I learned so much yeah. out of, you know, hey, how did you know, cloud offerings, you know, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. I mean, we were the infrastructure. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> but, you know, it, it definitely, you learned how to manage it, how to deploy it. And uh, and I think that, you know, that that's helped me through my career you know, a lot because I was there early, you know, doing a lot of that stuff. And what was the biggest challenge at GenBand? I think, remember when you and I and Don were first hanging out, you are talking about that massive, complicated uh, data center move? Yeah, there was a lot of that. But, you know, I'll be honest, from a business perspective, I think GenBand's biggest problem always was... Um, they were, they were pitching class five replacement too soon. And what I mean by that was we could have saved at and a lot of money mm-hmm. on power, on space. I mean, when you look at the data centers, when we went to California, I think we did one for, um, for them out there in California. We did one for SDC out there. And that data center, I think we had um, – Originally, it was in L.A., and I think they had almost 28,000 square feet of space for their Nortel switches that they were using for their Class 5. You know, we had wow. acquired that division, so we were selling them the new G9, G9000, our new yeah. gateway. What's the, what's the Class 5 just for the layman's terms? So for the layman's terms, that's, yeah. the, that's basically the phone switch for your phone company, right? Yeah. So, and so we had that offering, and um, when we made the offering to them, yeah, I think they had 20,000 square feet. It reduced their footprint to almost three thousand square feet. Oh my god! Just for the data center, right? Well, you think about a data center, twenty thousand square feet, air conditioning, cooling, electricity. Heating, how much we would have wow. saved them, right? And I tend to think we were a little too lackadaisical at that at GenBand. You know, we should have done better at that. You know, at the time, you know, maybe showing the the monetary value that we could save you space, we could save you power, et cetera, oh, yeah. right? All those things along the way. I mean, people think their home electric bill is a lot is nothing compared to a data center, which oh, has yeah. to be cooled like the Arctic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is great to work in the summers, but <laughs> and and a lot of the data center moves were great. It, you know, the, the Nortel acquisition was that was that was crazy. We had I think we had a ten million dollar a month hickey if we didn't get out of their data center. What's a hickey for the data so, terms? So what that meant was is I think we had I forget what our date was. It we had like eighteen months to get out of Nortel's uh, data centers. And for every month after that, we had to pay them $10 million. Ten. Ten. Oh my gosh. So if it was. This was before inflation, so that's <laughs> a lot of money. That's a lot of money. So if it took you three more months, it was $30 million. So oh we made our day. We didn't pay them. Right? Oh, that's great. So, which was great. But that was, that was a, that was a, that was a very big challenge. Because ultimately, too, we didn't take any of their servers. So what we ended up having to do was uh, Foy, myself, and quite a few others with Don and them, we actually built out. Our whole, we just bought as much hardware as we could get from Dell, yeah. and we built big VMware farms. We bought a big EMC Epsilon for storage. Nice. 
uh, you know, for the build outs, you know, we validated all that actually EMC pitched that incorrectly too. That was an issue we ran into is as we were doing builds with that new system, it didn't work. Well, it would function, but what should have taken us three to four hours was taking us three to four days. And you know, we'd brought EMC in, you know, you know, they were, you know, and that's one thing I'll give them. They, they, they did this. They, they said, this is the size, this is what we need to do. And then they were like, we messed up. They ended up giving us about $2 million worth of gear to, to cover it. But oh, really? it did finally eventually get to what we, what we had thought it would get to from yeah. a performance perspective. So, and we did. And, um, but those were, those were some challenging times getting through a lot of those. Well, that's great integrity too. That's, you yeah. really, I remember the wise, old, wise saying is you really don't know a man until his character is trusted or exactly. is tested. Mm -hmm. and it's nice that actually MC stepped up to the plate and yeah. got you, set you guys all straight with that. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, not everybody has always been that way. NetApp, when we were at Gen Band, <clears throat> I don't know if Don ever told you that story, but Foy, you know, we were sitting there when we lost one of our chassis and it was under warranty. We had, you know, we, we maintained our maintenance all yeah. the time. So just, it, yeah, it, it just, it just it went offline. It just went offline, died out. So, eh, okay, no big. So we call them and then they're like, oh yeah, you've been paying maintenance on that for two years, but it's no longer under warranty. So no, we're not going to help you. What? Like, wait, wait, wait. We've paid you for the maintenance. We've already paid. Yeah. And you're not going to help. No, we're not. What? You still took the money. Yes, we did. Jeez. So, well, they ended up giving us our money back eventually. But oh, really? Yeah. That's even more but, bizarre. Oh, yeah, that was the end of them. I, I would never deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> so they they kind of shot themselves <laughs> in the foot. The millions and millions of dollars I've spent since then on storage at Gen Band Tuesday morning, et cetera, is, will never be with them again because I'm not going to get caught in that one again. We actually yeah. did find a guy out of Boston that actually worked for him for a while. Mm. He We hired him to consult with us, and he actually helped us get a lot of our data off of. We, I don't think we got everything back, but we got, we got everything we needed out of it. I'll say that. So, mm -hmm. but, um, but that was a, that was one that was a, that was a big problem for us. So. And what inspired you to switch it up and get into the retail side when you're going to work at Tuesday morning? Well, and, and when I was at Gin Band for a long time, you know, Don, Don and them were looking at going other places, you know, and, um, I, I, I was getting kind of bored there and it's like, am I really, should I be here? Am I growing? And I didn't think I was really helping like I used to. Mm -hmm. So, um, I contacted Trent and, um, and I went to work for Trent Taylor over there Tuesday morning and that was a great move for me. I enjoyed that a great deal because I learned so much more going over there in the retail side. That was a eye opener, you know, for a national retail chain to see, you know, what, what they have to deal with on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know, from credit cards to, to registers, to the employees, to the security awareness training. I mean, everything across the board was just, it was just an eye opener. You know, how those processes are so important and how much they really impact that bottom line for the business, right? I think that that really showed a lot to me anyway from, you know, going over to the retail side. I was so much more complex than just walking to the store <laughs> and saying, oh yeah, there's milk on the shelf or, you know, it's back there. Is Imagine mm -hmm. there's just millions of hours and dollars spent on studying just the layout of the store. Like that's, that's why every single grocery store always has milk in the very back. Mm -hmm. And it's usually priced as a loss leader to get you in the store. You have to walk past, you know, 20 or 30 aisles of products that are more profitable. So that way they'll actually make money, not lose money on that single purchase. Right. And, <laughs> and Tuesday morning was pretty good. You know, Tuesday morning had a concept called a green card, which was much like that. So what that meant was, is they would send out, it was a, <clears throat> it used to be a green card that was an insert in the newspaper. That's why they call it the green card. Okay. Uh, it was, you know, they do a sale three or four times a year. Yeah. And it would be this green card sale. And it was always a something pretty good. It was a pretty good deal, something when somebody would want. So we would do this, but, but we never made money on that. But it drove a lot of traffic to the stores. Yeah. So uh, while we were there, one of the things we did was we started migrating more and more digital in there. Mm -hmm. So we tried to migrate more and more digital and less of the green card because they cost us a lot of money and the digital did not. And we actually got a return on our money on the digital ads. Oh, so, so as we would do digital advertising, you know, we'd say, Hey, we spent two or $3 million. We'd get back four or 5 million where on the green card, if we'd spend three or 4 million while it would increase our traffic, we wouldn't get that money back. Right. Really? Mm -hmm. I'm guessing it was it a lot easier to track. Like, cause if you printed out those actual coupons, if someone went to the store and they scanned it, was it, you well, it was always the price, right? It was yeah. that, that item was always that. So, you know, you got it no matter if you had the coupon or not. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so that's you, even harder to track, though. You, you, well, then ooh. you know, hey, yeah. you can see the traffic volume increase, but mm -hmm. you also know these all items all sold. But, hey, they sold for, you know, 
five million dollars and we paid six. So like, <laughs> uh, uh, not too good. That was an issue that we ran into, and and ultimately, I think that's one of the issues Tuesday morning still has today is there is distribution, right? Is that's a tough, tough thing to to crack, and it's even tougher for them because they're not like Walmart, they're not like a lot of other stores, the Burlingtons, et cetera, because they're smaller. Mm. And what a lot of people don't realize is when when they get a crate in of, you know, let's say they get a crate of like 300 Barbies in. Yeah. Well, Walmart takes that crate and he sends it to the store right over here on El Dorado. Mm. They get that crate and they sell it. Yeah. Well, when Tuesday morning gets it, they have to take that 300 and split that up to 100 stores. So they now have what we call Pactolite. Yeah. Or, you know, a lot of people call it, uh, many different things, but Pactolite's what we used to call it. And that's where you basically say, hey, here's a Barbie doll, here's a dish towel, here's, you know, a couple of cups, and this is going to go to this store because I pulled them from these pallets. So, you know, we had to stock the stores and plan and allocate, you know, to the stores based on what we purchased. And everything we bought was not like, you know, Walmart or whatever. We only, we we didn't reuse about 90% of our SKUs. 90% of our SKUs never came back because oh they were just one-time purchases, Right. So where Walmart pretty much reuses a lot of their SKUs, I think they're yeah. probably 60 or 70% they probably reuse, right? Oh, easily. And we were the opposite of that. We use a lot less uh, reuse anyway, but. That, sound, that sounds like a logis- logistical nightmare, especially <laughs> how much of that was automated too. Oh yeah, and that's that's part of the issue is the Dallas di- distribution center was not really automated very well. Phoenix was to a degree, but the cost in Phoenix was really high. So there was, you know, and there were other issues outside of that. So I think now they're looking at doing two, new distribution centers, but I think they're looking in Tennessee, one on the East Coast, and one in, like, Vegas is what yeah. I think they're looking at now. So, awesome. But, you know, that, that's what they were when I left. So that's, we don't talk about it. That's got to be one of the biggest challenges when you're competing against big box stores is not only the economy is a scale because you can buy more product to get it for a cheaper price per unit, mm-hmm. but also how do you distribute it cost effectively? Because right. if you see, like, the YouTube videos of the Amazon robots, those are an orchestration of – Marvel mm-hmm. to see how they will actually pick up every item, make sure it goes to every store. Mm-hmm. And with this, it's a much smaller scale. I and mean, the human factor so there's more errors, mm-hmm. but it's, it's also the cost of getting to every single store. So I wonder, I wonder if the future or the next step in retail evolution will be direct to store, like right, right when the ships get off the coast, yeah. will that go, will each crate go to one store or well, ultimately, and that's the question. Yeah, yeah. And, and I kind of think what I think you'll end up seeing is you're going to see more and more businesses. You'll see the Amazons and the Walmarts. That's their key differentiating factors, right? But I tend to think you'll see more and more um, logistic companies that will do this and be very proficient at it. Mm-hmm. I think they are better suited to do this than to take the Tuesday morning, you know, executives or Kirkland's executives or whoever, mm-hmm. and they figure out distribution because – it's not their business. Their business is retail, right? That's where right. it should be. And uh, so I tend to think you'll see more of that, and I'm hoping so because I think they will answer a lot more problems that I don't think these small to mid-sized retailers have answers for. Yeah. Right? So but then on the flip side, I wonder how many of them will want exclusivity contracts because I mean that's going to be oh yeah that's exactly proprietary because I know like fuel co- surcharges. I mean, there's all this oh, yeah. stuff, right? There's there's a lot of things that can go into that, uh, like you said. There's definitely a ton out there. And um, I tend to think you'll see more and more of that. Um, I don't know. I, I, You know, I know a lot of people are, are and I, I'll be honest, I actually did not think that flying drones were going to take off and do really well for a long time. I really thought it was going to be drivable drones first. Mm-hmm. But it does look like the, the flying drones are going to hit the market first. But I'm oh, still yeah. thinking that drivable drones, which we kind of have a little bit today with trucks. I mean, a lot of yeah. the trucks today are self-driving to some degree, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a there's a there's a pilot there, but oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they they are kind of self-driven. But I can't, I kind of think that's the big evolutionary step to bring costs down, mm-hmm. safety as well. I mean, I you know, I mean, we all know that computers are much safer driving and flying than we are. Yeah. <laughs> we're a little we're a little uh, <laughs> impulsive. Yeah, <laughs> right? true. Yeah. So, I so I still can't believe how quickly the drones are. I don't know. It's kind of like Uber. I thought. With drones, I thought the biggest barrier was going to be legislation and the FAA. Kind of mm-hmm. like how people thought Uber wouldn't. Mark Cuban passed on the opportunity to invest in Uber because he thought the unions and the cities wouldn't allow it. Right. So it turns, if we can have automated trucks, though, I mean, that's one of the biggest costs for items is the human factor and that labor. Mm-hmm. Then the fuel cost, and of course, right, the price of diesel these days, that's not helping. So exactly. I wonder, <laughs> I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if drones could do it more efficiently because, I mean, 
every item weighs, you know, the weight's going to be the hugest factor, especially when it goes to battery technologies. And if you're flying it, it'll be interesting to see how efficient they can get it. Yeah. So, I mean, Amazon's, I mean, they own their own planes now. Like, they own their own, and which should scare the living bejesus out of UPS when I think it was two or three years ago, Amazon announced, oh, yeah, we're going to get rid of that. And that was either 10 or 11% of FedEx or PS is one of those two is 10% of the revenue. It's going to be gone. gone yeah. yeah, it's, it, 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 you'll see more of that. And like you said, the question is, is will the battery technology keep up you yeah. know, for the flying drone? And that's why I always thought that the drivable drones would do better because of the, the horsepower required to keep it on the ground is different than keeping it in the air, right? A lot less. So, yeah, it's a lot less. So, you know, it's a little easier to drive than it is to fly, you know, from yeah. a, you know, uh, you know, a resource perspective. So, and so I always thought that that would be the case, but it does seem that the, the drones are kind of taking over a little bit quicker than I thought they would, the flying ones. So. All right. And well, especially if it's, I think it'd be especially efficient in the short distances where you have mm-hmm. those Amazon distribution centers. If a distribution center is within, you know, you know five, 10 miles from all these houses, then it might be more efficient to have the micro drones as opposed to the Amazon trucks where you have the human going in and out. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and companies like Tuesday morning need to find these small, t- cause I think that's where companies like a Tuesday morning and, and it doesn't, you know, and I know if you've seen it, dollar general's doing a little bit of this with pop shelf nowadays, yeah, they have this new, uh, close out like concept. higher end concept. Yeah. Right. And, and I tend to think, you know, when they get these footprints where they are, those drones could come in and deliver. I can deliver snacks. I could deliver this. I could do, or Tuesday morning needs to find that type of, you know, um, commodity that they could sell easily with a drone type that they can ship from their stores. Cause then you get the physical presence yep. as well as the distribution network that you've already built out. Right. So best of both worlds. Yeah. Best of both worlds. So, you know, things like that is where I kind of see companies like that going and, you know, moving forward. So and it, I don't know, retail is just one of the biggest Rubik's cubes of oh, of any business really oh, yeah. it's most complex and there's so many disruptions in the industry past i'll shoot 24 months mm-hmm. it's just what everybody can be immediately it's like it's so funny that oh that sells oh that yeah. does this this you know like liquid death like yeah <laughs> we're, we're paying two dollars for a can of water right yeah it's austrian though it's fancy <laughs> exactly, right so but it's a way they market it and, you know, and we were talking about the black rifle company there i think black rifle coffee company is offering a coffee with us now. It's like, yeah, that's that's brilliant. You know, find your market, you know, or create your market. Create that's, your market. That, that's right? really where the biggest disruptions or the mm-hmm. biggest opportunities are. But it's also the biggest risk. Like, how many companies failed before Netflix? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's where IT has to go. And I think IT needs to get more creative. Mm-hmm. I don't think we're very. I think there's a lot of creative people in IT, but I don't think we try to get as creative as we should. I think a lot of times we're so. We're so thought we're sometimes people think we're of us of us as an afterthought or whatever, but you know, don't think of yourself that way. Don't let the business does not need to know anything about it. They just need to be able to function and do what they want to do. Right. Right. That's what we're here for is we're supposed to give them everything they need magically. (laughs) Right. That's that's what we're (laughs) supposed to do. And, And that's the way you need to think of it. You are here to be creative as possible and just give them whatever you can, but you'll see people in IT. It's like, I don't want to do that. So and so does this. Why do they need, and you're like, (laughs) That's why you have a job. We yeah. all have a job because <laughs> so-and-so needs something. And, you know, I get the frustration level at times and sometimes people don't think they're listening very well. But, you know, ultimately, we're always here just to make sure that everybody has what they need. And um, and I think that's what you know, I'd like to see a lot more because I don't see that a lot. I don't see a lot of creative people out there or being, being overly creative at times with solutions, you know. Yeah. And I think that's important. So That's probably one of the biggest things. Biggest things I've seen in my career, well, obviously I'm more biased. We think IT is awesome, but it seems like there was a big pivotal moment when CEOs and shareholders went from seeing IT as a sunken cost and a necess- necessity mm-hmm. to where nowadays it's leading propelling businesses where you have like in retail, all those analytics of, Hey, if you're using Wi-Fi, they know your dwell time, uh, the dwell time, which mm-hmm. listeners who aren't familiar with, that's how much time you spend in front of a product. And one of the most fascinating ones is you ever hear the one about Nebraska furniture mart? Hmm. So they have all those really brilliant digital uh, tags. So instead of spending money on label machines, they have a digital tag in front of every piece of furniture. And it's kind of creepy, but if you're using the Wi-Fi, you know, spoiler alert, you stand in front of this couch, and let's say it's you know $5.99 for this couch. You stay there for 15 minutes. You walk away, go look at socks or whatever else they sell. You come back, they'll see your cell phone. They'll see it. The price will go down mm. just for you. It's 
Yeah, they know. Astonishing. Or, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that type of technology is obviously driving up sales, making the CEO and shareholders happy. And yeah. all of a sudden they're saying, hey, in technology, it's not just something you know we have to have. This is something that can actually propel our business. And nowadays, I mean, it's cliche, but everyone says, you know, if co your company is IT company, whether you like it or not, it's like mm -hmm. every industry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's what's fun is like you said, you know, you see these, these new, hey, you come back, so I'm going to reduce the price. And, you know, what are ways we can drive that? that buying decision to help, you know, the bottom line, right? I mean, that's, that's important. So oh, absolutely. And it's scary how much they know about you, but <laughs> kind of like how Facebook, that's why you gotta get aluminum foil or something for your cell phone. But if you talk about something, you will see an ad on Facebook for that exact product. <laughs> yeah, I don't care how many times it, it still freaks me out. You know, there's, you know, on TikTok or, or Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. And the next thing, you know, my girlfriend and I are talking about something. Next thing you know, there's an ad. Yeah, <laughs> and they and they but they tell us, don't worry, they're not listening. Yeah, that's what they say. Yeah, they're not listening. Yeah. <laughs> and then why did I get a diaper? We were just talking about that. Why were we? I mean, I'm fifty something years old. I don't need diapers. We were just talking about somebody getting diapers, right? So. Well, it's scary when they know more about you than you. I remember, like when I was in college, I think so. I think in 2010, there's a big article where uh, this father was at home. He had a wife and kids, and they were getting the you know the Sunday flyer for I believe it's Target. And, you know, all of a sudden, you got the same flyers for like, all these baby materials. And he got so pissed off, he called Target. He's like, why am I getting all this crap? I don't need it. <laughs> and, like, later that day, he found out his daughter was pregnant. Oh, wow. <laughs> so they knew more about his family than he did. <laughs> <laughs> that's always a great thing. Right? It's like, oh, that's why you're getting it. She's We're probably not pregnant. Yes. Yeah, she, she's browsing online to your website for, you know, whatever hours. But and I believe that was, that was the actual website. But, oh, wow. yeah, they just... You know so, so much. Oh, I know. It's so crazy nowadays. <laughs> oh, it's ridiculous. And, and you were at Tuesday morning when COVID hit, too. Oh, yeah. 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 So we were not a very um, remote business at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, they were retail, so they, they had that thought process. So basically, you know, we had to make everybody remote quickly. Mm -hmm. So we went out and bought a lot of laptops. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> People came and got their desktops, you know, went home. Um, and we handled a lot of that. But one of the things we did um, at the time was, you know, we were still reeling. And honestly, everybody was. We didn't know when should we reopen? Is there a time when we should be reopen? You know, what are the things we could do? Is there a reason we should be open? So as we started looking at it, you know, at Tuesday morning, we sold a lot, you know, of soaps. And, you know, you know we have a lot of shampoos, you know, you know, food items, et cetera. So we are, we were a legitimate essential you know, business. Essential business. Yeah. So, so our, our, our legal team... And you have, you, have stores, you had stores all across the U.S. To, mm -hmm. to make it even more complex because every state had their own parameters. And, yeah, at the time, I think we had about 820 stores. Oh, when, wow. When COVID hit, is, yeah. is we, were st we were still at around, around 800 stores, I believe, if I remember right. It may have, we, may have done some, we may have done some cutbacks by then, but we were somewhere around you know, 750, 800 stores then. And then um, we closed everything down for about, about a month, I guess it was. We'd furloughed most of the employees. There was still there was there wasn't very many of us, but you know we had an old point of sale system, so we had to go shut it down. And you know there were certain things you had to do because you know, on our old point of sale system, you had to reopen a store every day. So so as since we brought everything offline, you know I I brought the Meraki's offline too because I didn't want the stores just to be yeah up and attacked <laughs> right right. I don't I didn't have very many people working. You know it was just me and maybe one or two other people. So so we shut as much down as we could. You know the things we needed up, we left up. Um, and, um, and we focused on that and keeping us going. And then the legal team, you know, got the correct documents out to get us reopened. And we finally started getting the stores reopened. You know, then we had the issues with trying to find product and, you know, that was yep. difficult at times too, but you know, they, we worked and found ways to, you know, get things through. But ultimately that was a very eye opening experience because we were all very creative. It, it, it was very interesting to see how the business and and IT work together at that time. It was amazing how how creative we got and how quickly we worked together and how well we all worked together. I mean, we all really worked together as a team, I thought, at the time. I mean, I know Tuesday morning I had to file bankruptcy and all, but that was, yeah, a lot of that was just, you, you shut down, that's what happens. You know, yeah. you don't have that kind of cash. Oh, I know. So, no one does. Well, yeah. So, so we did, and, um, yeah, they went through their bankruptcy. They sold a lot of their assets but got out of it relatively unscathed. Uh, you know, the new management team's there now, you know, hopefully they're, they're figuring out ways they need to go. But I mean, ultimately, you know, companies like Tuesday morning need to be online. They need to sell things, yeah. you know, 
it's like everywhere else. Yeah. And I think that's the the next piece for you know a lot of those small to mid sized retailers like them and Kirkland's and the others is they've got to find ways to do more online and and tie it to their store because ultimately Tuesday morning and a Kirkland's and, and stores like that was Pier One mm-hmm. was you know people they like. People like going into those stores and looking at that stuff. I mean, that's there's yeah. a reason that off price retail does well, and it hasn't done as well online as it as, as it as it does in the store because people like to touch home goods. They like to feel them. They like to you know know what they feel like. So that's there's some advantages there. But you can I think you can drive those both ways, and I think that's where they you know hopefully they'll find a a good uh, solution for themselves and you know help grow their business. Better. Well, that's the fun thing about that industry. It's also, you know, tradi- go to traditional Kroger or Walmart, you'll have mm-hmm. the same 60 to 80 SKUs. It's not a lot of surprises where you're bargain hunting. It's yeah. in a, kind of like an exploration or a treasure hunt. You never know what you're going to find. Right, yeah. And <laughs> and that was always the big Tuesday morning thing, you know, is it's a treasure hunt. You know, yeah. Treasure trove. So, you know, yeah. my mom and them still does. I mean, my mom is their, like their typical customer. She she and her friends, you know, once a month, they get together and they go to like four or five Tuesday mornings. They just drive around town. Oh, really? Around. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> Yeah, and and that's I think that's a very common thing for customers to do for them. You know, that was kind of their customer, our customer base when I was there. You know, uh, you know that may be different now, but you know I know when I was there, you, I travel a lot to the stores and see a lot of the same people. Yeah. You know, in in different stores. You know, hey, I'd see the same people in Allen as I would in Plano and McKinney, and you know even some of the Dallas stores. You know, um, I was over in Fort Worth one time and saw somebody that was over in the, in the that I had ran into at the uh, Murphy store one time. I'm like, really? that's a weird run into like <laughs> Murphy and Fort Worth. Long drive, so yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's, that's, well. that's key. You gotta have those unique experiences to get them in the door, and that's mm-hmm. that's becoming harder and harder as more and more things are bought online due to convenience, time, and cost, and everything like that. Yeah, because that's me. I mean, I like to buy stuff online because I don't have to go anywhere. Right? I yeah, can, I can get what I need <laughs> and move on pretty quickly. So definitely. And then, how do you like working at Neighborly? A lot of people don't know they're the parent company between behind most of the brands we think of when it comes to kind of. Yeah, physical man. services at homes and such. Yeah, home, you know, home services, you know, like Mr. Rooter, Molly Maid, uh, Mr. Handyman, Mr. Appliance, right? So a lot of different brands. But yeah, it's it's been great. You know, I've been there, you know, three months now, a little over three months. So um, building our new security program there out. And it's, um, you know, the growth there is amazing. Uh, the, the management team seems really focused and, you know, what they're doing and, you know, really building this, you know, We've set it up into three pillars. We have uh, the maintenance side, the uh, the maintain, the enhance, and then repair. Right. So, and that's the way they keep focused. They um, uh, they were out of Waco, I guess. Originally, it was where they started. It was Rainbow out of there, and then you know, now they've got a big presence here in Irving as well as Waco, as well as you know in the UK and uh, Germany uh, throughout uh, Canada now. So, yeah, you know, as we as we acquire more companies and build this brands, um, you know, we're just. We're just continuing to grow. So. There you go. <laughs> I love the culture. Can you tell, mm-hmm. tell us a little about that? Because that's one of yeah. the most unique things about them. Yeah, so one of the things I got to do is our, you know, they have an annual employee um, training day that basically gets together every day, one day a year, and, you know, really tries to help us, you know, not just help us motivate us, but, you know, help us motivate overall, be more creative, be more thinking. And one of the things we did was, you know, they brought in the group, and if you guys were familiar with that, uh, a few years ago there was a group of um, – soccer team from uh thailand i think they were like 10 to 12 year old boys they all got stuck in a um in a uh, cave they were visiting a cave and then the monsoons hit early and the caves flooded well they got stuck in a section of the cave that was pretty far back and these were all 10 11 year old kids so they you know they couldn't dive they couldn't cave dive cave divers are you know i mean that's not even a navy seal type thing that's more of a it's more of a hobby thing so so as you know there was a there was a whole uh documentary on that and but they brought the team that actually saved the kids back over and we got to listen to what they did how they decided to do things yeah you know, the creativity they came up with uh, most of the kids you know they couldn't they couldn't go for two miles underwater so so what they did was they actually gave the kids uh, a sedative to knock them out and swim the kids out one at a time so that's how they got all the kids out. Now, ultimately, we all know all the kids survived. Yeah. Because we know that, right? But there were, uh, I think it was one of the divers actually died, did not make it. Uh, one wow. of the national divers uh, there in Thailand didn't make it. But it was a very interesting concept because it, it showed how different the Thailand culture is compared to American culture or, you know, anywhere else, right? And everybody has their own. Because one of the guys that actually did a lot to, you know, the, the, the cave divers were going to leave. 
they were about to leave and because nobody was talking to them. There was nobody that knew what they were doing. They figured, uh, we don't need those guys. Well, one of the guys that was an expat from America, he had actually been living there for a while, married a, a woman over there in Thailand, had kids, and raised a family. Well, the the general, the I guess their, their chief of staff, she worked for him. And so he knew this guy from originally because her parents had passed away. So he was kind of like her father figure. He had dinner with him. You know, he had a relationship with this gentleman and, you know, asked for her hand. And so, so culturally, when he went and talked to the general, because no one was telling the higher ups that there's these real serious problems. We've got to get these kids out now because if we don't, they are going to die. And um, no one was really relaying that up the ladder. So because he had that relationship, he went and had dinner with the general and explained all the issues. And then they were able to get the kids and get the right people in the right spot to get those kids saved. Because ultimately, wow. in Thailand, it's about the relationship. Where yeah. in America, you'd be like, look, we got to get these kids or they're going to yeah. die. But this, <laughs> oh, well, he had a relationship, built it out, you know, and, and that's how that's how they um, they got the access that they needed to get the approval they needed to save the kids. So it's, oh, wow. So it was a pretty amazing story and, uh, you know, very creative ways to come about, you know, fixing that and, you know, getting it taken care of. But I, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was really amazing. So Absolutely. And what do you like to do outside of work? You got a little farm you like to work on? Yeah, we have a, we have a little uh, a nine acre, 10 acre farm up in uh, Whitesboro up there. So we raise some Angora goats. Kim's watching this. Hi, Kim. <laughs> Her goats. She's the, so yeah, and we, uh, uh, we have a couple of miniature donkeys up there and, uh, Enjoy our we enjoy our farm up there. It's nice. It's very quiet and it's very peaceful and um, not very um, built up out there yet. So, yeah, <laughs> which is nice. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> although uh, yeah, up there in Sherman, I don't know if you guys are heard they've they're building that thirty billion dollar TI plant up there. So I have a oh, feeling wow. we're going to get a lot of neighbors soon. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, definitely yeah. So my family's been here in Texas for. The 1600s, I think, is when my, my dad's side of the family came down. And, uh, wow. Where'd so you come, he come from? Uh, I think they came from France originally. So when the French were here is when our family came over. That's awesome. Uh, from what we've traced back. Wow. And then uh, my, my great-grandfather was actually kidnapped by Indians over there in Mineral Wells area. So um, his name was Sam Savage. There's a historical marker at his grave that kind of talks about that whole period and, you know, kind of what happened. I think they killed his dad and his aunt and his uncle and some cousins, and they kidnapped him. He was five, I think, five or six, and then the girl was like four, and there was a nine-year-old boy, I think three of them that they had kidnapped. And um, they took him up to Tulsa, and I think it was a, um, a trader had traded a saddle for the three kids because he had saw the ad that those three kids were missing from Manuel's and brought them back and, and dropped them off, you know, with our, my great, I guess it would have been my great-great-grandmother at the time. And that, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, all those kids, you know, those three kids, you know, survived at least into their adulthood. Um, but, um, but yeah, he, he lived a long time. He was actually a, a big fiddle player. Um, he was actually eventually, I think they wouldn't even let him compete in a lot of the fiddle contests because he always win. Oh, so, really? Yeah, Bob Wills and a lot of the Texas players, Johnny Gimble and them would come and visit him and, you know, learn how to play things for, I don't know, I mean, whatever they did back then, I don't know. I mean, I was not. I was not a. I, I wasn't born back then, so yeah. when they were when they were around, but you know, I did meet some of those people later in life after you know I was born. But uh, it was very interesting to to see that part of the family that had musical talent. And Definitely. So yeah. hey, has the family always been to farming, or do, is that just something you want to get into? No, it's uh, you know my dad was in the scrap business, my brother was in the scrap business, and uh, but yeah, farming's always fun. You know, I've always kind of thought of farming as being our roots, right? You know. That's, yep kind of what we do here in Texas. So agriculture, at least yeah. cows and so forth, right? So Absolutely. I was going to say it's on my bucket list to get myself my Texas ranch <laughs> with enough enough land where you don't have to ask for permission to do anything. Yeah, I want to raise some miniature cows because, you know, they have, they're, what is it? They're about a, they're about a half the, the weight, but about a third of the resources required to raise a cow. So really? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're, we're looking at that right now. We're thinking Raising some panda cows out there if anybody knows what those are. So. Is that what they're called? <laughs> well, some of them are. So like, That's too if you cute. Breed, yeah, there's a highland that, that if you look up a panda cow, you'll see it. They're, they're really cute. So That's awesome. So, but yeah, that's pretty neat. So And highland cows are pretty neat. And uh, we're looking at a lot of different ones. So, so definitely. And our goats are, you know, it's, it's that time of year we're getting ready to, we'll be trimming them here in a couple months, I think. 
So you have to trim like a sheep. Yeah, they're 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 much. You have to trim them about twice a year. So oh really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they and if you look at them, most people think they're sheep. like oh, is that your sheep? No, those are goats. <laughs> those are angora goats. So what? So what animal is the least maintenance, or what's the easiest to take care of? For so for folks who want to just get into ranching or dream about having a ranch like me. I, you know, any goat is pretty, well, I mean, not, not a fiber goat, you had a, you know, you know, <laughs> but you know, even cows, you know, longhorns, goats, those are all pretty easy to raise. So they're not difficult, you know, so yeah, donkeys are fun too. But you know, the one thing, that's the reason we have the donkeys and a livestock guardian dog, because you out there, you do have a lot of coyotes and stuff and they will, they will kill your animals. So oh, donkeys will keep those away. They'll keep bobcats and coyotes away. And so our livestock guardian dog, he. He is constantly out there at night. Like, really? Mm. You know, you can hear him <laughs> chasing them off, you know, keeping the coyotes away. So, so a, dog can take, a dog can take on a coyote? Oh, yeah. Pretty easily? Yeah, he's, well, you know, those, those, those livestock really? guardians, those, he's a great Pyrenees. So I think at the vet the other day, he weighed 105 pounds. So he's, That's pretty big. That's yeah, a pretty good fella. He's pretty good. <laughs> but you know what's funny is he doesn't, he doesn't kill those coyotes. Like, what he'll do is he'll run on top of them mm -hmm. and he'll stand on them. And he'll bite them at the neck, yeah. And then he'll back up and let them go, and he'll bark it until they leave. Really? Yeah, he won't kill them, and it's kind of weird. I don't know why he doesn't. He just generous, like, giving them a maybe, warning. Maybe I don't know. A warning yeah. cut or a warning a bite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but you know, because I have seen livestock guardian dogs actually kill coyotes and stuff, but not 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 no. him. He doesn't. He doesn't do that. So, so it's very interesting. And then are they? I know hogs are big nuisance for a lot of farmers do you guys have to deal with that or we don't that... have them up there in our area so mm -hmm. thank goodness for but, now <laughs> uh, yeah right now we don't but um yeah the other day i saw somebody killed a couple of hogs and dumped them in the in the um the um just on the side of the road up by the farm over the other day oh really yeah there's two whole hogs and they're like, i'm like man what the that's hell? not a good sign <laughs> no it's <laughs> not a good is sign. it one that attract coyotes and other <laughs> yeah it will but you know the, the buzzards it, well, they'll eat it up pretty quick you know Oh really? Yeah, in our area, the buzzards and the crows are still battling. So you know they're the buzzards kind of went out more times than not, but the crows come in sometimes too. But <laughs> really, <laughs> yeah, they battle back and forth. So and right there where we are in Whitesboro is that big um, that migratory bird um, um, sanctuary is just north of us, right there. At Lake oh Minnesota. really? Yeah, it's like right. I mean, really, it's like if you drive to it, it's about three miles, I think, three or four miles from the farm. There's a there's a migratory bird sanctuary up there on Lake Texoma. It's a big marshland area that they've got up there. They've set aside for them, and it's we get a lot of herons, a lot of cattle egrets. I mean, everything comes flying through all the time because nice. of all those birds. So sounds awesome. I might yeah. come over and check it out one of these yeah, days. Yeah, you come out and see. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. I'll just say I'll let everyone get going. Thanks again for coming on the show, bud. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks everyone for listening. Don't forget to click like and subscribe. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Tell your enemies. Tell anyone. And, of course, all the links are in the description. Thanks again. Stay safe, everyone. Topping Talks.